There are dozens of examples in recent decades of the United States sponsoring coups to overthrow foreign democratically elected leaders. Some of the most famous examples include Iran's democratically elected Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh, who was overthrown in a CIA-backed coup in 1953, or another CIA-backed coup that overthrew Guatemala's democratically elected president, Jacobo Armenz, in 1954, or yet another CIA-backed coup that overthrew Chile's democratically elected president, Salvador Allende, in 1973. There are many, many more examples. These are just some of the most well-known cases. But what ties together all of these leaders who have been targeted for destabilization by the United States is that they have pursued policies that go against the interests of U.S. corporations, of U.S. financial interests, of Washington's attempts to control their natural resources. Most of these leaders were socialists or leftists or simply nationalists, and their biggest so-called crime was refusing to subordinate their country and their national interests to the geopolitical and economic interests of Washington. And just in the past year, we have yet another example of a democratically elected leader who was overthrown in a U.S.-backed coup for opposing U.S. foreign policy interests. Today, I'm going to be talking about Pakistan's democratically elected prime minister, Imran Khan, who was removed in a political coup d'etat in April 2022. And we have smoking gun evidence showing that the U.S. government sponsored this political coup to remove Imran Khan. Now, since this coup happened, we here at Geopolitical Economy Report have published numerous videos analyzing the evidence that already existed showing that the U.S. was involved. In the description below, I will link to some of the previous videos that we've done analyzing the coup in Pakistan featuring Pakistani experts from inside the country. Imran Khan gave public speeches saying that the U.S. government was trying to overthrow his elected government. He referred to the U.S. as a kind of imperial slave master that treats countries in the global south as if they were its slaves. And after he was overthrown, Khan referred to the unelected coup regime as the imported government, saying that it was imported by Washington. Now, from the very beginning, Khan had been saying that there were documents from inside the Pakistani government showing that the U.S. State Department had been pressuring and essentially threatening Khan and telling him that he had to support NATO and the U.S. in the proxy war in Ukraine against Russia. Khan refused to do that. Instead, he maintained neutrality in the proxy war in Ukraine. He said, we are not with either side. We are doing what's in our own interests. We are not acting simply on behalf of Washington's interests. Khan said that the U.S. had told him that if his government did not take the position of Washington, it would face real problems in the future. This was clearly a kind of mafia-style threat. And when Khan made these comments... He was criticized by many media outlets, not only in the West, but in Pakistan, because much of the media in Pakistan is controlled by wealthy corporate oligarchs. They portrayed Khan as a crazy conspiracy theorist who is just trying to, you know, throw red meat to his followers. But we now know that Khan was telling the truth. This August, the mainstream U.S. media outlet, The Intercept, published that leaked document proving that the U.S. State Department pressured Imran Khan and eventually backed the coup that removed him over his refusal to join the U.S. in the proxy war in Ukraine. And that's not all. In September, The Intercept published another article, which is more smoking gun evidence, showing that after Imran Khan was removed in the U.S.-backed coup, the new unelected coup regime made an agreement in which Pakistan gave military equipment to the U.S., which the U.S. gave to Ukraine. So the Pakistani coup regime, which is essentially governed by the military, made an agreement to send weapons and ammunition to Ukraine to help Ukraine 
in this NATO proxy war against Russia. And in return, the United States pressured the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, to give a big loan to bail out the Pakistani economy, which was on the verge of bankruptcy. So this clearly shows, by the way, that the IMF is a complete political organ of the United States. It's called multilateral, but it's a tool of Washington. But by the way, it also shows that the IMF has been using these loans to fund Western wars, proxy wars. The IMF has also been giving loans to the Ukrainian regime in the middle of this proxy war. And furthermore, this is clearly an example of an IMF loan going to fund corruption. The current unelected coup regime in Pakistan is run by criminals who are notorious for corruption. They were investigated and charged with corruption and money laundering. And now the IMF, under the leadership of the U.S., is giving this money, these loans to Pakistan, knowing that, that the regime was not elected and is completely unaccountable. And that money is clearly going to be used to fund corruption and capital flight. So here we have two reports in a mainstream U.S. media outlet proving what we at Geopolitical Economy Report have been saying for over a year, what many Pakistani activists and journalists have been saying for over a year, that the United States backed a coup to overthrow Pakistan's democratically elected independent nationalist leader, Imran Khan, and installed what is essentially a corrupt puppet regime, which is really just run by the military. Now, what this really shows is that, tragically, the United States treats Pakistan as a kind of colony. And Pakistan was previously part of India before independence from British colonialism in 1947. And it was part of the British Empire. It was a colony. And even though in 1947, Pakistan became independent and on paper got independence from European colonialism, today the U.S. exercises neo-colonial control over this country. And again, I need to stress, this is a huge country of more than 230 million people, the fifth most populous country on earth. But it's also a nation that for decades has suffered from nonstop U.S. meddling, which has prevented the country from economically developing, from becoming politically independent, and from really showing its true potential. And this brings us to Imran Khan. Khan governed Pakistan as a nationalist, maintaining a completely independent foreign policy, not subordinating his country to the United States, which historically Pakistan has had this very subservient relationship to Washington. And in fact, in December, he gave a speech saying that Pakistan should not have been allied with the United States during the first Cold War. And today, Pakistan should maintain a non-aligned foreign policy. It always should have been non-aligned and should refuse to support the new Cold War against Russia and China. And I feel that Pakistan should not take any sides. I'm talking about our country. Because, you know, why, why do we have to take sides? Pakistan should have good relationship with both China and with the United States. Uh, similarly, I feel with Russia and, and the United States. For instance, that's the policy of India. I must say that I've always admired the way India remained non-aligned during the Cold War. I thought it was a, a sensible thing to do. I mean, when you become part of a block, that means that the whole other block is excluded from you. And of course, you know, great powers do put a lot, enormous pressure on you to take sides. So let me first say that China-Pakistan relationship goes back a long time, 60 years. And China has been what we call always a friend in need. China has stood by Pakistan, you know, whether it is on international forums, on politics. For instance, Kashmir is an issue, a United Nations resolution on Kashmir stating that they should be, they should have been a plebiscite in Kashmir for the people of Kashmir to decide whether they wanted to be with India or Pakistan. And that right was not given to them. But no other, hardly any other country stands with us. Uh, China has always stood with us. And I must say, Turkey has stood with us. But you know, other, even Muslim countries, despite knowing the, the uh, injustice going on in Kashmir, just like in Palestine, they do not uh, stand with us. Which is, by the way, one of the reasons I feel 
that when we are told to take sides in, in a conflict like Ukraine, why should we? When things that are important to us, uh, the Western countries don't take a stand or moral stand on it. And so I feel that, uh, so I think we should be non-aligned in this. We should be neutral. We should be friendly with both. Those words right there succinctly explain why Washington backed this coup against Imran Khan. Not only did he maintain neutrality over the proxy war in Ukraine, but he also deepened Pakistan's alliance with China. Historically, Pakistan and China have been very close allies. So while, yes, Pakistan has also been a U.S. ally, it has also maintained very close political and economic relations with China. And Pakistan plays a very important role in the Belt and Road Initiative, which is Beijing's international infrastructure project. China and Pakistan have created something called the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, which plays a very important geostrategic role with trade routes and railroads that go from China through Pakistan south to the port of Gwadar and out into the Arabian Sea and the Indian Ocean. So Pakistan plays an important geostrategic role in the integration economically of Eurasia. Pakistan is also a member of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, along with China and Russia and India and Iran just became a full member of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. And speaking of Iran, Imran Khan had also been improving Pakistan's relations with Iran, building trade ties, and publicly, Khan condemned the illegal U.S. sanctions on Iran and called on Washington to lift its sanctions on Iran after Donald Trump tore up the nuclear deal, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. And by the way, I should point out that Iran not only signed that deal with the U.S., it also signed that deal with the all of the permanent members of the Security Council and the European Union. It was only the U.S. that withdrew from the agreement and imposed sanctions on Iran. So by showing support for Iran in this way, that was another reason that Washington was very angry at Imran Khan. And then there's the issue of Israel-Palestine. The United States has been pressuring countries, Muslim-majority countries like Pakistan, for many years to normalize relations with the Israeli apartheid regime. And Imran Khan always refused to do that. He always strongly supported the right of the Palestinian people to self-determination against Western-backed Israeli colonialism. And under the Trump administration, with the so-called Abraham Accords, the U.S. pressured the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain to normalize relations with the Israeli apartheid regime. And clearly, the U.S. was also pressuring Pakistan to do the same. And Imran Khan said, absolutely not. Now, I've talked here about all of the many reasons why the U.S. wanted to remove Imran Khan. But the incident that really sealed his fate was when the Pakistani prime minister took a trip to Moscow and he met with Russia's president, Vladimir Putin. And the fateful date when Khan visited Moscow was the day when Russia initiated its military operation in Ukraine. Now, obviously, Imran Khan did not know that this was going to happen. In fact, the trip, his trip to Moscow had been planned for many months in advance. But the day that he arrived was the 24th of February, 2022. Russia sent its troops into Ukraine. The West immediately condemned Russia, began imposing sanctions and pressuring countries all around the world to condemn Russia. But Imran Khan refused. And in fact, not only did he maintain neutrality, saying that we do not support any side in this proxy war, Khan also criticized the West and said, why are you treating us as your slaves? We are not your slaves. But all of that changed after the coup. The new unelected coup regime in Pakistan, which was run by corrupt oligarchs who were being investigated for corruption and money laundering, they immediately allied with the U.S. and supported NATO in this proxy war in Ukraine. And the top general in the military, the army chief of staff, General Bajwa, publicly condemned Russia for invading Ukraine and supported the Western narrative. Ladies and gentlemen, Pakistan is deeply concerned about the conflict in Ukraine. With Ukraine, we enjoy excellent defense and economic 
relationship since its independence. With Russia, we had cold relation for a long time due to numerous reasons. However, recently there have been some positive development in this regard. Sadly, the Russian invasion against uh, Ukraine is very unfortunate as thousands of people have been killed, millions made refugees and half of Ukraine destroyed. This is a huge tragedy which must be stopped immediately. Furthermore, despite legitimate, con legitimate security concerns of Russia, its aggression against a smaller country cannot be condoned. Now, since the coup, the Pakistani coup regime, which is completely unelected and has no democratic legitimacy, has been violently repressing protests. There have been massive protests for many months against the unelected regime, which Imran Khan and his supporters refer to as the imported government, imported by Washington. The coup regime has banned any mention of Imran Khan in the media, imprisoning journalists, exiling journalists. Some journalists have been murdered and thousands of supporters of Imran Khan have been arrested and brutalized by police. And Imran Khan has been imprisoned on completely bogus charges of corruption, which were clearly politically motivated. And even when the Pakistani courts have cleared him of these bogus charges, the coup regime has invented new, also equally absurd charges to try to keep him in jail. The latest charges accuse Imran Khan of leaking confidential government documents to the, the press and that is used as an excuse to keep him in prison. What they don't mention is those documents that he's accused of leaking, although it, there's no evidence of that, are documents proving that the US government was involved in overthrowing his elected government. So he's being imprisoned for exposing the fact that he was the victim of a foreign-backed coup. And meanwhile, the unelected government has refused to hold elections. They have continued moving back the date of potential elections. Now they say there are going to be elections held at the beginning of 2024, but they may push those back yet again. And even if there are going to be elections, they will be completely illegitimate because Imran Khan, the most popular politician in Pakistan, will not be able to participate as part of the lawfare, that is the judicial warfare against him. The coup regime has prevented Imran Khan from running for office for several years. And the coup regime has destroyed his political party, the Movement Toward Justice Party, the PTI party. Leaders of that party and allies of Imran Khan have been arrested, kidnapped, exiled from the country. Some have even been killed. So what we're seeing is a brutal dictatorship, a, an authoritarian regime in Pakistan that is clearly run by the military and has the staunch support of the United States and also the European Union. And these Western governments constantly lecture the rest of the world about so-called democracy and human rights while they're supporting a brutal, bloody dictatorship in Pakistan. And why? Because it advances their geopolitical and economic interests. Polls even by Western firms have shown that Imran Khan is the most popular leader in the country. In March, the US polling firm Gallup did a poll in Pakistan and found that he is the most popular leader in the country. 61% of Pakistanis gave him a positive rating. Meanwhile, the unelected prime minister at that time was Sheba Sharif, a man who was so blatantly corrupt that the government had to drop its investigation into his corruption in order to allow him to become so-called interim prime minister, completely unelected. The poll found that he had only 32% support and 65% of Pakistanis opposed him. So that's the complete opposite. The unelected leader backed by the West had two thirds of Pakistanis opposing him and one third of Pakistanis supporting him. Whereas with Imran Khan, it was the inverse. Almost two thirds, 61% of Pakistanis supported Imran Khan and one third, 37% opposed Imran Khan. So by preventing him from running for office, by preventing the media from even mentioning his name, the Pakistani coup regime has destroyed any semblance of democracy in the country. Now, I should also point out that this is not even the first time that the United States has backed a coup against a popular leader in Pakistan. In 1977, 
Pakistan's military, with the support of the United States, overthrew the leftist prime minister Zulfikar Ali Bhutto. He was a socialist and a left-wing nationalist who tried to implement policies to develop the country, to industrialize Pakistan so it wasn't so dependent on the Western powers, and to fight poverty in a country with rampant poverty. The military leader who overthrew him, Zio ul Haq, was an ultra-conservative Islamist, and the United States propped him up, backing the ultra-right-wing Zia ul Haq regime for a decade as he dismantled all of the left-wing economic policies of his predecessors, as he implemented mass privatizations and sold off state assets to Western corporations, and as he also imposed very conservative Islamist ideas, and Pakistan collaborated with the US and Saudi Arabia to support the Mujahideen, the Islamist extremist rebels in Afghanistan, fighting against Afghanistan's socialist government backed by Soviet forces. So at that point, Pakistan was engaged directly in a proxy war against the Soviet Union in alliance with the US. So you should keep this in mind because there are many examples throughout history of the United States supporting many of these very right-wing conservative Islamist elements. And then during the so-called war on terror, the US cites those very same ultra-conservative Islamists as an excuse to justify intervention in regions where the US for decades supported those forces. So Washington has always backed the most reactionary, anti-progressive elements in Pakistan, and the US has frequently backed the military, which is the most powerful institution in the country, which has ruled Pakistan for much of its history, and no prime minister has ever been able to finish his term in office. And this brings us to Imran Khan, who was democratically elected, but overthrown in a political coup in April 2022. At the time of the ouster, there were reports in Pakistan that the US ambassador was meeting with opposition politicians from the parliament, the National Assembly, and basically bribing or threatening them to vote to overthrow Imran Khan in a vote of no confidence. This was a parliamentary coup that was very similar to the 2016 US-backed parliamentary coup in Brazil, which overthrew the left-wing president Dilma Rousseff of the Workers' Party. And it was also very similar to yet another US-backed coup, which was in Peru in December 2022, when the corrupt right-wing oligarch-controlled Congress also overthrew the democratically elected president, Pedro Castillo, who once again was a leftist representing poor and working people in a country, Peru, where the political system has historically been dominated by wealthy oligarchs, corporate elites. So there's a very clear pattern here. Now, in the case of Imran Khan, he was not necessarily a leftist. His political ideology was much more nationalist, and he had a, a much more progressive form of kind of Islamic nationalism. And he always emphasized the importance of Pakistan maintaining an independent foreign policy. So in many ways, you can compare Imran Khan to Iran's prime minister, democratically elected prime minister, Mohammad Mossadegh, who was not a socialist, but he was a progressive nationalist. And in Iran in the 1950s, nationalized the oil reserves in the country, which angered British and US oil corporations. So the CIA backed the coup to overthrow him. And in fact, back in December, Imran Khan pointed out how similar the coup against Mohammad Mossadegh in Iran was in 1953 compared to the US-backed coup against him. In Iran, during uh, Mohammad Mossadegh's uh, premiership, and his government was removed, and this is now documented, was removed by the CIA. And it was uh, because uh, an independent-minded prime minister came and took over in Iran and wanted uh, to, to make policies for the interest of the people of Iran. And so we all, you know, the... Uh, we, we all know what happened to him. You know, there was this, first of all, there was this um, uh, campaign, uh, propaganda campaign against him in the media. Then it was uh, the opposition parties were paid to do uh, 
demonstrations against the government of uh, Pre uh, Prime Minister Mossadegh, and then, and then the, uh, his own party members were given money to change party affiliation, and eventually it was the uh, the the final was the was the army which removed him. So it was a very similar uh, pattern followed uh, in when my government was dismissed. But you know, let me just talk about Iran. I find that it is most important for a country to live with dignity and self-respect. I mean, that for me is the most important thing. You know, we Muslims, uh, you know, our, our oath with the Almighty is La ilaha illallah. There is no God but Allah. It gives us dignity, self-respect. We, you know, we are not supposed to bow in front of anyone but the Almighty. And the Muslim countries, you know, when they become subservient or when they become client states, when they lose their dignity, you know, and unfortunately in Pakistan, we have suffered from this. I have found the Pakistan's foreign policy, vast majority of the people of Pakistan have found it uh, very undignified because we have relied on aid and we stretch our hands and we get money or we, or we fight other people's war and then, you know, we participate a lot of our own people die in this and, and, and we, we do it for foreign aid or U.S. dollars. And I think, you know, it has consequences for a society. Number one, the con society never learns to stand on its own feet. Because only when you stand on your own feet, do you realize your strength. But when you are always having crutches of foreign aid, just because, you know, you are trying to serve someone else's foreign policy objectives, you lose your dignity. And for me, uh, uh, the people of Iran might have suffered, but you know, they haven't lost their dignity. They, they you know, we, we will disagree with, you know, maybe what their worldview is. We might disagree with their worldview of Islam, but you know, you cannot disagree with them standing for their sovereignty. So, you know, I admire that about them. And by the way, I should point out that Washington's opposition to Imran Khan did not begin in 2018 when he became prime minister. In fact, politically, he had been very outspoken against the so-called war on terror that the United States was waging that not only involved Afghanistan, Pakistan's neighbor, but also drew in Pakistan. So Imran Khan had been very famous in Pakistan because he was a, an, a star athlete playing cricket. So pretty much everyone in Pakistan already knew who he was from the days he was a cricketer. But when he started getting involved in politics, Imran Khan organized protests inside Pakistan against the U.S. drone war, against the NATO military occupation of Afghanistan. And the Western media demonized him as so-called Taliban Khan. They portrayed him as a supporter of the Taliban, but in reality, he was against the Western war that not only destabilized Afghanistan, but that violence also spilled over the border into Pakistan, and the United States was carrying out drone strikes inside Pakistani territory, killing thousands of people, including many civilians. So when Khan came to power in 2018, he told the United States, the U.S. military will not be allowed in our territory anymore. No more drone strikes, no U.S. military bases inside Pakistani territory. We are an independent, sovereign country. And obviously, this infuriated the United States. So when Joe Biden came in in 2021, and when he withdrew the U.S. soldiers that had occupied Afghanistan for 20 years, the U.S. was trying to pressure Pakistan to allow the U.S. to create military bases, in particular drone bases, because they were leaving Afghanistan, but they still wanted to carry out military operations to try to maintain control over the region. And Imran Khan said, no, absolutely not. Well, these were all factors that led to the U.S.-backed political coup that overthrew Imran Khan in April 2022. And today, the Pakistani coup regime, which has not been elected, never, it is completely undemocratic, it is now allowing the U.S. military to use Pakistani territory to carry out operations. And furthermore, the Pakistani government, the coup regime, has been selling weapons to the U.S. to send to Ukraine. So Pakistan is arming Ukraine 
in this NATO proxy war against Russia after Imran Khan had refused to support the war and maintained neutrality and boosted his country's relations with Russia. Now, earlier I mentioned that a mainstream U.S. media outlet, The Intercept, published a document proving that the U.S. State Department backed the coup against Imran Khan over his neutrality in the proxy war in Ukraine. This is an article published on the 9th of August titled Secret Pakistan Cable Documents U.S. Pressure to Remove Imran Khan. At the bottom of the report, they have a transcript of the diplomatic cipher, which is the internal Pakistani document proving that the U.S. pressured the government and backed the coup. And this is recounting a meeting in March from the 7th of March, 2022. And it was a meeting held between top State Department officials, including the U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of South and Central Asian Affairs, Donald Liu. And on the other side of the table was Pakistan's ambassador to the U.S., Assad Majid Khan. And the document in the, in the document, this is written, this is from the Pakistani diplomat. So it's from Pakistan's side. And in the document, it's written the first person by Assad Majid Khan. And he recalls a lunch that he had with the U.S. Assistant Secretary of State, Donald Liu. And the Pakistani ambassador refers to him as Don. Again, so when he says Don, he's talking about the U.S. Assistant Secretary of State. And he said, at the outset of the meeting, Don referred to Pakistan's position on the Ukraine crisis and said that, quote, people here and in Europe are quite concerned about why Pakistan is taking such an aggressively neutral position on Ukraine. If such a position is even possible, it does not seem such a neutral stand to us. So very angry that Pakistan is neutral because if a country doesn't take Washington's side, the U.S. says they're not neutral because the U.S. sees the world as its imperial property, as an emperor, and anyone who doesn't side with Uncle Sam is not really neutral, even though Pakistan was neutral. Now, he complained, the U.S. Assistant Secretary of State complained, and he said that, quote, it seems quite clear that this is the prime minister's policy. So he's clearly mentioning Imran Khan, and he's saying that, Imran Khan is a thorn in our side. Why is he being neutral in this war? So this is the U.S. acting as if Pakistan were not an independent, neutral country. Why is this the U.S.'s business? It's not. Pakistan is a sovereign country. It should be able to maintain its own independent foreign policy. But clearly, Washington does not believe that. Now, the Pakistani diplomat points out that the U.S. was very angry about Imran Khan's visit to Moscow. And, he, and the U.S. Assistant Secretary of State, Donald Liu, said, quote, I think if the no confidence vote against the prime minister succeeds, all will be forgiven in Washington. I want to repeat, this is very important. The no confidence vote was being backed by the U.S. government. The U.S. The US embassy was meddling in internal Pakistani politics, pressuring members of the National Assembly in Pakistan to vote against Imran Khan, to overthrow Imran Khan. And here the U.S. top diplomat is saying very clearly, if you overthrow Imran Khan, the elected prime minister, quote, all will be forgiven in Washington. We will no longer have anything against you. But he said, the Russia visit is being looked at as a decision by the prime minister, by Imran Khan. So he's saying that if you do not overthrow Imran Khan, quote, I think it will be tough going ahead. So this is a threat. This is a top U.S. diplomat from the State Department threatening Pakistan's ambassador, saying, if you do not overthrow your prime minister, it will be tough going ahead. We are going to pressure you. We are going to threaten you. And then he said, in Europe, I suspect their reaction will be similar. So here, the U.S. is not only treating Pakistan as a colony, it's saying, yeah, in Europe, they go along with whatever we want. So if, if Imran Khan doesn't play by our rules in the so-called rules-based international order in which the U.S. makes the rules, it will be tough going ahead. And then he adds, quote, honestly, 
I think isolation of the prime minister will become very strong from Europe and the United States. This is a smoking gun. This is the assistant secretary of state from the US for Central and South Asian affairs telling the Pakistani government that we will isolate you, we will pressure you, we will threaten you unless you break your relations with Russia and support Ukraine in this proxy war. Now, in response to this threat, the Pakistani ambassador defended the prime minister Imran Khan, and he pointed out that the visit to Moscow had been in the work for in the works for at least a few years. It was the result of a deliberative institutional process. When Imran Khan was flying to Moscow, the Russian invasion of Ukraine had not started and there was still a hope for a peaceful resolution. He also pointed out that European leaders had likewise been traveling to Moscow to meet with Russian President Putin. But those visits, the U.S. ambassador defended those visits by the European leaders. And the U.S. ambassador said, quote, those visits were specifically for seeking resolution of the Ukraine standoff, while the prime minister, that is Imran Khan's visit, was for bilateral economic relations, bilateral economic reasons. So here the U.S. is basically telling Pakistan, you're not allowed to have bilateral economic relations with Russia. We control you. You are our colony. And specifically, what the U.S. diplomat was acknowledging here was that when Imran Khan visited Russia and met with Putin, he signed economic agreements in which Russia agreed to sell Pakistan wheat and oil at very low rates, below market value. So Russia clearly wanted to have much better relations with Pakistan, and this was in Pakistan's economic interest, cheap energy and cheap wheat. Pakistan is a country that has suffered for a long time from a current account deficit, that is, it often imports much more than it exports. Pakistan imports a lot of things like food, energy, machine parts, and because of this chronic current account deficit, Pakistan has faced a lot of inflation. We're talking about inflation in the double digits. So Imran Khan was acting in the economic interests of his people by going to Russia and, and signing these economic agreements that would help minimize inflation in the country, reduce food prices, reduce energy prices. And when the price of energy is reduced, that tends to reduce other forms of consumer price inflation because you need oil, obviously, to transport goods. And if oil prices rise, then the price of other goods tends to rise as well. So Pakistan was acting in its own economic interests. And the U.S. is telling Imran Khan, no, you are not allowed to act in your own economic interests. You have to act in our economic interests. Pakistan is a U.S. colony, according to Washington. That's the way they see it. And here we have smoking gun evidence of a top U.S. diplomat basically telling Pakistan exactly that. We are allowed, we in the West, are allowed to have trips to Moscow in order to try to, to stop this war. But when the Pakistani elected prime minister goes to Moscow and signs trade deals with Russia, that is not allowed. That's what this diplomatic cable published by The Intercept proves. It's a smoking gun. And further down in the document, you can also see the Pakistani ambassador to the US telling Washington that clearly the US had been having a very negative relationship with Pakistan. He said, quote, I said that over the past one year, we had been consistently sensing reluctance on the part of the U.S. leadership to engage with our leadership. This reluctance had created a perception in Pakistan that we're, we were being ignored and even taken for granted. There was also the feeling that while the U.S. expected Pakistan support on all issues that were important to the U.S., it did not reciprocate, and we did not see much U.S. support on issues of concern for Pakistan, particularly on Kashmir. So here we see the Pakistani ambassador saying, look, you have been demonizing our leader, our elected prime minister, Imran Khan, for many months now. You have been ignoring his phone calls. You have been treating us as inferior. You have been ignoring us, and 
when there are issues that are important to you, you tell us we have to vote with you. We have to support you. But when there are issues that are important to us, you ignore us. So again, this is the kind of neo-colonial relationship that the U.S. maintains with countries around the world. When Washington says countries have to abide by the so-called rules-based international order, this is what Washington means. The U.S. makes the rules and orders everyone around. And if you don't follow Washington's rules, you face very serious consequences, up to and including coups. Now, the Pakistani ambassador also pointed out, he said, we were surprised that if our position on the Ukraine crisis was so important for the U.S., why did the U.S. not engage with us at the top leadership level prior to the Moscow visit and even when the U.N. was scheduled to vote? By the way, under Imran Khan, Pakistan voted to be neutral over the war in Ukraine. It abstained. And since the U.S.-backed coup, the Pakistani coup regime has been voting in support of the NATO proxy war in Ukraine against Russia. So here he's saying very clearly, you know, you say that you're so angry about our votes and yet you ignored us and refused to engage with us. And there's another very interesting part here about the double standard on India, because India has been a reliable Western ally against China, but Pakistan has been a close ally of China. This point is very important. I want to stress this again. So India has good relations with Russia. Russia is an Indian ally, but India has a very tense relationship with China. And the U.S., of course, the main goal of Washington's new Cold War is not Moscow. It is Beijing. China is the main target of Washington's new Cold War. Of course, Russia is as well, but China is the main target. Russia is the secondary target. And because Pakistan has very close relations with China, the U.S. has been pressuring Pakistan to weaken its economic and political partnership with China while not putting as much pressure on India. And also because India is a much bigger country, India is the most populous country on earth. It has 1.4 billion people compared to the 230 million people in Pakistan. So, I mean, Pakistan is a very big country. It's the fifth most populous country on earth. But compared to India, which is just such a massive country, that is why the U.S. has not pressured India as much. And Pakistan was complaining about this. In this cable, we see that the, the Pakistani ambassador said, quote, it seemed that the U.S. was applying different criteria for India and Pakistan. The U.S. appeared to be more concerned about Pakistan's position. And then this is another smoking gun we should keep in mind for the future. The U.S. Assistant Secretary of State, Donald Liu, was evasive, but he responded that Washington looked at the U.S.-India relationship very much through the lens of what was happening in China. This is a smoking gun proving that the U.S. is trying to use India to weaken China. So the U.S.-India relationship is based on what is happening in China. That's what he said. So because Pakistan is a close Chinese ally, the U.S. has been completely denouncing Pakistan and the Imran Khan government backing a coup against him. And now the U.S. has been pressuring the Pakistani coup regime to try to weaken its relations with China. But the U.S. has been trying to ally with India against China and trying to encourage a schism within the BRICS, encouraging conflicts inside organizations like the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, trying to break off India's ties with China, just as the U.S. in the Sino-Soviet split supported China and allied with China against the Soviet Union. The U.S. is now trying to repeat that by allying with India against China. And at the end of this diplomatic cable by the Pakistani ambassador published by The Intercept, we see the U.S. just clearly denounce the government of Imran Khan. And the Pakistani ambassador said that he expressed the hope that Imran Khan's visit to Russia will not impact Pakistan's relations with the U.S. And the State Department official Donald Liu replied, quote, I would argue that it has already created a dent 
in the relationship from our perspective. Let us wait for a few days to see whether the political situation changes, which would mean that we would not have a big disagreement about this issue and the dent would go away very quickly. Otherwise, we will have to confront this issue head on and decide how to manage it. So here, he's saying very clearly, in the next few days, we will see whether the political situation changes. He's saying there could be a coup, a political coup against Imran Khan. If Imran Khan is removed from office, the dent would go away very quickly. Otherwise, we will have to confront this issue head on. So he's again threatening Pakistan and saying, if you don't remove your democratically elected prime minister, we will do something against you. We will decide how to manage it. This is how mafia leaders talk. And this is a top US official. This is the US empire. This is how Washington actually operates. It talks about democracy. It talks about human rights. But meanwhile, the US organizes coups against democratically elected leaders around the world, threatening them. And if they don't follow by the so-called rules in the rules-based order that Washington rules, then they face serious consequences. And the assessment that the Pakistani ambassador made at the end of the cable, he said, Donald Liu could not have conveyed such a strong demarche without the express approval of the White House, to which he referred repeatedly. So this is clearly an order that was coming from the Biden White House, saying that Imran Khan needs to be removed from office we cannot tolerate Pakistan having close ties with Russia. Pakistan is our colony. That's how the U.S. sees it. And he said, clearly, Donald Liu, the Assistant Secretary of State for Central and South Asian Affairs, spoke out of turn on Pakistan's internal political process. We need to seriously reflect on this. So he's saying that this is completely out of turn. This is completely unacceptable. This is an example of the U.S. meddling in our internal affairs and threatening us. This is neocolonialism. And what happened after? Well, as The Intercept showed in this report, the U.S. helped Pakistan get an IMF bailout with a secret arms deal for Ukraine. So this, this is the reward. The unelected Pakistani coup regime run by a bunch of corrupt criminals were given billions of dollars from the International Monetary Fund, which has been shown once again to be a political organ controlled by the U.S. The United States is the only country on earth that has veto power in the IMF, and the U.S. used the IMF to give this bailout to Pakistan. In return, the Pakistani coup regime gave weapons to Ukraine to continue to fuel this never-ending proxy war against Russia. And here we can see a graph of the foreign exchange reserves of Pakistan. And the Pakistani coup regime was running dangerously low on its foreign exchange reserves. And you can see that in January of 2023, it reached just $8 billion. And their forex reserves remained dangerously low, around $9 billion, until suddenly in July, they reported that it had jumped up to $13.5 billion. And that is thanks to the IMF loan. And with more money in its foreign exchange reserves, this has helped Pakistan to slightly stabilize inflation in the currency, although it has really got out of control. I mean, we're talking about inflation in Pakistan in the past few months, peaking at over 40%. And still today, it is at nearly 30%. These are just sky high rates of inflation that have destroyed the savings and purchasing power of average Pakistani workers, of poor and working people in Pakistan, impoverishing them. And a lot of this money, I mean, part of it was going to try to stabilize the currency, but also clearly this money is just going to fund capital flight and corruption because when you install into office as an unelected leader, someone who's being investigated and was charged with money laundering, it's no surprise that they continue to engage in corruption. Those are the people 
that the U.S. has backed in power in Pakistan. And now they continue to push back the elections. They refuse to have elections. And even if they hold elections, they will be completely illegitimate because they have imprisoned Imran Khan and the most popular politician in Pakistan. They have destroyed his political party, the PTI, and they are now preventing Imran Khan from running in future elections. This is a dictatorship. This is an authoritarian regime led by the military and sponsored by the United States and its European allies. Never forget this. When the West talks about democracy and human rights, this is what they really mean by their beloved rules-based order. On that note, I'm going to conclude here. As always, these videos end up being much longer than I hoped, but I wanted to go into detail because I think, again, it's very important to understand what's happening in Pakistan, not only because these are the same tactics that are repeated again and again in countries all across the planet, but also because Pakistan is a very important country. It is the fifth most populous country on earth, 230 million people, and yet, unfortunately, I think it is often ignored in Western media. So I wanted to spend a lot of time today talking about this very important historical episode. There's a lot we can learn from it looking forward. And on that note, I want to thank everyone for joining me today. I want to remind everyone to please subscribe on whatever platform you're watching or listening on. If you're watching on YouTube, please like the video and subscribe to our channel. It helps to promote our material in the algorithm. And there's also a podcast version of every video that we release if you prefer listening to the podcast. And if you like the work that we do, please consider supporting us. You can donate in a few ways. If you go to geopoliticaleconomy.com slash support, the best way to sustain our work is you can go over to patreon.com slash geopolitical economy and become a patron. We are completely independent. We have no institutional support. We have no big donors. We rely entirely on small donations from viewers and listeners like you. I want to thank everyone for joining me today. I'm Ben Norton of Geopolitical Economy Report. I'll see you next time.